In this section, we'll go from the knee to a little below the ankle. We'll start by looking at the bones and the joints of the ankle region. Then, we'll look at the muscles which produce movements at those joints. Lastly, we'll look at the blood vessels and nerves of the region. Before we start, we need to understand the meaning of some anatomic terms regarding the foot and its movements. The upper and lower surfaces of the foot are called the dorsal surface and plantar surface. This part of the foot is called the tarsus. These bones are the tarsal bones. The long bones in front of them are the metatarsals. We'll be looking at two sets of movements which happen in two different places. The upward and downward movements that occur at the ankle joint itself are called dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. The side-to-side -side rocking movements that occur at the joints just below the ankle are called eversion for turning outwards and inversion for turning inward. Lastly, speaking of definitions, you'll recall that the leg in anatomy means just the part of the lower extremity that's between the knee and the ankle. Now let's look at the bones. We'll start by taking a further look at the two long bones of the leg, the tibia and the fibula. The tibia is much the larger of the two bones. The shafts of the two bones are covered by muscles, except for the anterior medial aspect of the tibia, which lies directly beneath the skin, all the way from the knee to the ankle. The proximal end of the fibula doesn't form part of the knee joint, but its distal end forms an important part of the ankle joint, as we'll see. The tibia and fibula are held together throughout their length by the strong interosseous membrane. Above and below, they're attached at the two tibiofibular joints. The proximal tibiofibular joint is a synovial joint. The distal one is a fibrous joint. There's very little movement at either of these joints. Distally, the two bones are strongly held together by the anterior tibiofibular ligament and the posterior tibiofibular ligament. The projecting ends of the tibia and fibula, which stick out on either side of the ankle, are called the medial malleolus and the lateral malleolus. The articular surface for the ankle joint is a broad notch formed by the curved undersurface of the tibia and the inner surfaces of the medial malleolus and the lateral malleolus. Now let's look at the bone that articulates with the tibia and fibula to form the ankle joint, the talus. This is the talus. The bone below and behind it is the calcaneus or heel bone. The bone in front of the talus is the navicular bone. We'll meet the other tarsal bones shortly. Now we'll go around to the lateral view to see the talus by itself. This is the head of the talus. This is the neck. The talus has three articular surfaces, one on the head and one on the underside for the two joints of inversion and eversion, and one on top for the ankle joint. Here's the ankle joint. Let's see how it looks in the living body. Here, the loose parts of the joint capsule have been removed, leaving these thickened parts, which are the ligaments of the joint. Here's the front of the joint in plantar flexion. Here's the back of the joint in dorsiflexion. On the lateral side, the joint is held together by the posterior talofibular and anterior talofibular ligaments. On the medial side, it's held together by this massive ligament, the deltoid ligament, which attaches not only to a broad area on the talus, but also to the adjoining bones below and in front, as we'll see shortly. The ligaments of the ankle joint ensure that the talus can't rock from side to side, like this. 
or move backward or forward like this relative to the tibia and fibula. Here's the ankle joint with its joint capsule intact and with the rest of the bones in place. The capsule of the ankle joint is loose on the front and it's also loose on the back. This looseness allows for a full range of dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Now we'll move on to look at the two joints of inversion and eversion. There's one directly beneath the main part of the talus called the subtalar joint, and there's one below and in front of the head of the talus that has an unwieldy name, the talocalcaneo navicular joint. We'll call it the TCN joint for short. To understand these joints, we need to get acquainted with the remaining tarsal bones. We already know the talus, the calcaneus, and the navicular. In front of the navicular are the three cuneiform bones, first, second, and third. Lastly, the bone in front of the calcaneus is the cuboid bone. Now let's look at the calcaneus by itself. The posterior part of the calcaneus forms the heel. The massive calcaneal tendon, also called the Achilles tendon, is attached here. Here on the medial side, there's a projecting shelf which the medial part of the talus sits on, called the sustentaculum tali. On the front of the calcaneus, there's an articular surface for the cuboid bone. On the upper aspect of the calcaneus, there are two articular surfaces for the talus, a small one in front, a larger one behind. The larger of these two surfaces, together with the corresponding surface on the underside of the talus, forms the subtalar joint. The head of the talus fits into a socket, which we'll see by taking the talus away. The socket is formed by this surface of the calcaneus, this surface of the navicular bone, and by a strong ligament here, which we'll see in a minute. These surfaces, together with the head of the talus, form the talocalcaneo navicular joint. Here's what these joint surfaces look like in the living body. The surface for the subtalar joint and the two surfaces for the TCN joint. This structure in between, which forms part of the TCN joint, is the upper surface of the strong calcaneo navicular ligament, also misleadingly called the spring ligament, which helps to hold up the head of the talus. It goes from here on the calcaneus to here on the navicular. The movement that happens at the subtalar and TCN joints is a rocking motion that takes place around an obliquely placed axis. This rod shows the position of the axis. It's oblique to the long axis of the foot, both in this plane and in this plane. Here's eversion. Here's inversion. Again, eversion and inversion. Several strong ligaments hold the malleoli, the talus, the calcaneus, and the navicular bone together. On the medial side, which we'll see first, there's one extensive ligament to look at, the deltoid ligament. We've seen part of it already. Now here's the whole of the deltoid ligament. This is the part we saw before, going from the medial malleolus to the talus. In addition, parts of the deltoid ligament fan out below onto the sustentaculum tali of the calcaneus and in front onto the navicular bone so that the deltoid ligament holds all four of these bones together. On the lateral side, there are two important ligaments. The calcaneofibular ligament, which goes from the lateral malleolus to the side of the calcaneus, and this strong ligament, the interosseous talocalcaneal ligament, which goes from here on the calcaneus to here on the talus. To see that ligament better, we'll remove the talus. The interosseous talocalcaneal ligament lies between the subtalar joint and the TCN joint. 
Now that we've seen the ankle joint and the joints of inversion and eversion, we'll look very briefly at the remaining joints of the tarsus. Between the navicular and its neighbors, the cuneiform bones and the cuboid bone, there's hardly any movement, but there is a small amount of rotation between the cuboid and the calcaneus, which lets the front part of the foot invert and evert a little, independently of the calcaneus. We'll see more of the bones and ligaments of the foot in the next section. For now, we've seen enough to understand how the joints of the ankle region move. Before we go on to look at the muscles that produce those movements, we need to take a look at some important pulley-like structures that are attached to the bones of the ankle region. These are called retinacula, the singular of which is retinaculum. Each retinaculum guides and keeps in place a set of tendons that pass from the leg to the foot. There's a retinaculum on the front of the ankle and one on each side of the ankle, behind and below each malleolus. Here on the front are the upper part and the lower part of the extensor retinaculum. These aren't isolated structures. They're localized thickenings of this layer of investing deep fascia, which we'll meet later. Four tendons, a nerve and an artery, pass under the extensor retinaculum. On the lateral aspect, behind the malleolus, Here's the perineal retinaculum. It accommodates the tendons of two perineal muscles as they pass around the lateral malleolus. On the medial side, the flexor retinaculum fans out from the back of the medial malleolus. The space beneath the flexor retinaculum is divided into four separate tunnels. Three tendons and the posterior tibial vessels and nerve pass through these tunnels as they pass around the ankle and into the foot. Now let's review what we've seen of the bones, joints and pulleys of the ankle region. Then we'll move on to look at the muscles of the leg. Here's the tibia, the fibula, the medial malleolus, the lateral malleolus, the talus, and the ankle joint. Here's the interosseous membrane, the proximal tibiofibular joint, the distal tibiofibular joint, the posterior tibiofibular and talofibular ligaments, the anterior tibiofibular and talofibular ligaments, and the deltoid ligament. Here's the calcaneus the cuboid, the three cuneiform bones, and the navicular. Here are the surfaces for the subtalar joint and for the TCN joint. Here's the calcaneo-navicular ligament, the calcaneo-fibular ligament, and the interosseous talocalcaneal ligament. Here's the extensor retinaculum, the perineal retinaculum, and the flexor retinaculum. Now we'll move on to look at the muscles that produce movement at the joints of the ankle region. In doing this, we'll meet most, but not all, of the muscles that are in the leg. There are four muscles that are in the leg, which we'll leave out of the picture till the next section. These are the long flexors and the long extensors of the toes. Along with the muscles, we'll meet the various layers of deep fascia, which divide the muscles of the leg into rather distinct compartments. We'll start with the muscles that produce dorsiflexion and plantar flexion at the ankle joint. Next, we'll look at the fascial layers and compartments. Lastly, we'll look at the muscles of inversion and eversion. First, then, the dorsiflexors and plantar flexors. Dorsiflexion involves just lifting the foot. Plantar flexion involves lifting the whole body. So it's not surprising that the muscles for plantar flexion are much larger than the ones for dorsiflexion. There's one muscle on the front of the leg for dorsiflexion, tibialis anterior. There are three on the back of the leg for plantar flexion, gastrocnemius, soleus, and 
Plantaris. Here's Tibialis anterior. Tibialis anterior arises from the lateral surface of the upper tibia and from the interosseous membrane. The tendon of tibialis anterior passes under the extensor retinaculum and winds around the medial side of the tarsus to insert right down here on the first cuneiform bone and on the base of the first metatarsal. The main action of tibialis anterior is to produce dorsiflexion at the ankle. Dorsiflexion is not the only action of tibialis anterior. It also has a role in producing inversion, as we'll see shortly. What's more, tibialis anterior is not the only muscle that produces dorsiflexion. It's assisted in that by the long extensor muscles for the toes, which we'll see in the next section. We'll move on now to look at the muscles that produce plantar flexion. Two large muscles, gastrocnemius and soleus, and one small muscle, plantaris, join together to form the massive calcaneal tendon. Here's gastrocnemius. Here, deep to it, is soleus. Gastrocnemius has two heads, a medial and a lateral. These arise, as we've seen, from the medial and lateral condyles of the femur. The two heads of gastrocnemius unite, forming a flat tendon. The gastrocnemius tendon, in turn, unites with the tendon of soleus to form the calcaneal tendon. To look at soleus, we'll remove gastrocnemius. Here's the whole of soleus. Here's its medial border, Here's its lateral border. Here's the cut edge of the gastrocnemius tendon. Soleus arises from the medial edge of the tibia, from this oblique line on the back of the tibia, and from this area on the back of the fibula. Between the fibula and the tibial origins of soleus, there's an arch of fibrous tissue. The popliteal vessels and the tibial nerve pass beneath this arch. Here are their divided ends. For completeness, we'll add plantaris to the picture. Here it is. Plantaris arises here on the lateral epicondyle of the femur. The long tendon of plantaris runs almost to the ankle before uniting with the calcaneal tendon. The calcaneal tendon is also known as the Achilles tendon, or simply the heel cord. It inserts into a broad area here, on the back of the calcaneus. In front of the calcaneal tendon, there's a pad of fat, which fills the gap between the tendon and the back of the ankle joint. The action of soleus, gastrocnemius, and plantaris is to produce plantar flexion at the ankle joint. Their action lifts us up off the ground when we stand on tiptoe. When balanced against gravity, the same action controls our rate of descent. In addition, these muscles provide an important part of the propulsive force in normal walking, in going uphill, in running, and in jumping. Before we move on to see the muscles that produce inversion and eversion, we need to digress for two minutes to look at the layer of deep fascia that surrounds all the muscles of the leg, and the three fibrous partitions, or septa, that divide the leg muscles into somewhat distinct compartments. This outer layer is the investing deep fascia. It surrounds all the muscles of the leg. The investing deep fascia is attached to the tibia here and here. It's attached to the fibula not directly but indirectly by two fibrous septa here 
and here that we'll see in a minute. The investing deep fascia wraps around the back of the calcaneal tendon like a sling. Distally, the investing deep fascia is continuous with the superficial part of the flexor retinaculum, with the perineal retinaculum, and with the two parts of the extensor retinaculum. Now we'll look at the fibrous septa, the singular of which is septum. There are three of them. Together with the interosseous membrane, they divide the muscles of the leg into four compartments, two on the front of the leg and two on the back. We'll look at the back first. We'll remove gastrocnemius and soleus down to here. Here's soleus divided. Here's the investing deep fascia divided at a lower level. In front of soleus, this transverse intermuscular septum crosses the back of the leg. It runs from here on the tibia to here on the fibula. Three muscles that we haven't seen yet lie between the transverse septum and the bones. To see the transverse septum better, we'll remove the rest of the soleus. The transverse septum is thin up here, but toward the ankle it becomes thicker. At the ankle, the transverse septum is continuous with the flexor retinaculum. The other two septa have cumbersome names. They're the anterior and the posterior crural intermuscular septa. To see them, we'll remove the investing deep fascia down to here, exposing several muscles that we haven't met yet. We'll be meeting them soon. This is the posterior crural septum, lying just in front of the soleus muscle. This is the anterior crural septum. These two septa are attached to the fibula here and here. The anterior crural septum divides the muscles in front of and lateral to the two bones into an anterior compartment, which contains four muscles, including tibialis anterior, and a more laterally placed perineal compartment, which contains two of the three perineal muscles. Now that we've seen these fascial structures, let's get back to the muscles, the ones that produce inversion and eversion. There are two muscles that produce inversion, tibialis anterior, which we've seen already, and tibialis posterior. Here's tibialis posterior. Tibialis posterior arises from the back of the tibia, the back of the fibula, and from the interosseous membrane in between. Its tendon passes immediately behind the medial malleolus through a fibrous tunnel that's covered by the flexor retinaculum. Beyond the malleolus, the tendon of tibialis posterior fans out. It has a wide insertion here on the navicular and first cuneiform bones, and also under here on the bases of the second, third, and fourth metatarsals. Here's the action of tibialis posterior. It inverts the foot. The other muscle that can act as a foot inverter is tibialis anterior, which inserts so close to tibialis posterior that it has almost the same line of action. We looked at tibialis anterior in its role as an ankle dorsiflexor earlier in this section. Now we'll move on to look at the three muscles that evert the ankle, peroneus longus, brevis, and tertius. Here's perineus brevis. Perineus brevis arises from here on the distal fibula. Lying on top of perineus brevis is perineus longus. 
Perineus longus arises from here, on the proximal fibula. Its origin extends up onto the head of the fibula, with a gap here. The deep perineal nerve passes under the upper end of Perineus longus here, as we'll see. The other muscle in the picture here is tibialis anterior. At the ankle, the tendons of Perineus longus and brevis pass behind the lateral malleolus and beneath the perineal retinaculum, longus behind, brevis in front. Perineus brevis runs forward to insert here, on the base of the fifth metatarsal. To see the remarkable course of the perineus longus tendon, we have to remove the entire sole of the foot. Perineus longus runs around the cuboid bone and along a deeply placed fibrous tunnel to insert right over here, on the base of the first metatarsal. Lastly, in front of perineus brevis and longus, here's perineus tertius. Perineus tertius arises from here on the fibula. The tendon of perineus tertius passes under the extensor retinaculum and in front of the lateral malleolus to insert here on the base of the fifth metatarsal, next to perineus brevis. The action of all three of the perineal muscles is to evert the foot. In addition, perineus tertius, acting along with its anterior neighbors, can help to dorsiflex the ankle. The muscles of inversion and eversion are important because they enable us to stay balanced and upright on a surface that tilts to one side or to the other. Now that we've looked at the muscles that produce movement of the foot, we're nearly ready to move on to the vessels and nerves of this region. Before we do that, let's review what we've seen of the muscles and the associated fascial structures. Here's the investing deep fascia. Here's the posterior crural intermuscular septum the anterior crural intermuscular septum, and the transverse intermuscular septum. Here's tibialis anterior, gastrocnemius, soleus, and plantaris, and the calcaneal tendon. Here's tibialis posterior, perineus longus, perineus brevis, and perineus tertius. Now we'll move on to look at the vessels and nerves of the region. We'll go from the knee, where we saw them last, to just below the ankle. We'll start with the veins. Here's the leg with the skin removed. To expose the two major superficial veins, two strips of subcutaneous fat have also been removed. Here's the short saphenous vein on the back, and the long saphenous vein on the front. The long saphenous vein passes over the medial malleolus, which is here, and runs up the medial side of the leg. We've seen its more proximal course in the previous sections of this tape. The short saphenous vein runs up between the calcaneal tendon and the lateral malleolus. It goes up the back of the leg and passes through the deep fascia near the knee to join the popliteal vein. To see some of the superficial veins in more detail, we'll remove the subcutaneous fat from the back of the leg. The short saphenous vein, like the long saphenous vein, is joined by a number of superficial branches. The saphenous veins are also joined by several perforating veins, like this one, which bring blood from the muscle compartments that lie deep to the investing deep fascia. In the last section, we saw the principal deep vein of the leg, the popliteal vein. 
Here it is again. With the tibial nerve behind it and the popliteal artery in front of it, it disappears between the two heads of gastrocnemius. In this section, we won't follow the deep veins any further, since their course is just the same as that of the corresponding arteries. We'll look at the arteries next. The three main arteries which supply the leg and ankle region are all branches of the popliteal artery. They're the anterior tibial, the posterior tibial, and the perineal. In the dissection that we'll see, all the veins have been removed to simplify the picture. Here's the popliteal artery, passing between the two heads of gastrocnemius. Its branches to gastrocnemius have been removed. To follow the popliteal artery, we'll remove gastrocnemius. The popliteal artery runs down the back of the popliteus muscle, then passes through the fibrous arch in the origin of soleus. We'll remove soleus. At the lower border of the popliteus muscle, the popliteal artery gives off this major branch, the anterior tibial artery, which runs forwards. We'll follow it in a minute. The popliteal artery then ends by dividing into the perineal artery and the posterior tibial artery. We'll follow the posterior tibial artery first. It runs down the back of the leg, just behind the deep posterior muscles. It's covered by the increasingly thick transverse intermuscular septum, which we'll remove. As it passes toward the medial side of the ankle, the posterior tibial artery it lies just behind tibialis posterior. At the ankle, the artery passes through a tunnel beneath the flexor retinaculum, part of which has been removed here. Within its tunnel, the posterior tibial artery divides into the medial plantar and lateral plantar arteries, which will follow in the next section. Next, we'll look at the perineal artery. The perineal artery passes laterally and runs beneath a muscle that we'll be looking at in the next section, flexor hallucis longus. We'll remove it. The perineal artery runs down between the deep posterior muscles, close to the fibula, which is here. It gives off numerous branches to the surrounding muscles and ends behind the lateral malleolus. Lastly, we'll look at the anterior tibial artery. Here's where we saw the anterior tibial artery last, arising from the popliteal artery. It immediately passes forward through a gap in the interosseous membrane. We'll go round to the front to follow it. Here it is emerging. The anterior tibial artery runs down the leg on the interosseous membrane, just lateral to tibialis anterior. The long toe extensors, which have been removed in this dissection, lie lateral to the artery. At the ankle, the anterior tibial artery passes beneath the extensor retinaculum. Here's the artery emerging on the dorsum of the foot. Beyond this point, it's called the dorsalis pedis artery. We'll follow it further in the next section. Now we'll look at the nerves of this region, the tibial nerve and the common perineal nerve. We saw them last at the knee, the tibial nerve disappearing, along with the popliteal vessels, between the heads of gastrocnemius. The common perineal nerve disappearing underneath perineus longus. We'll look at the tibial nerve first. To follow it, we'll remove two muscles which it supplies, gastrocnemius and soleus. The tibial nerve follows the same course as the posterior tibial artery. The nerve passes beneath the flexor retinaculum, just behind the artery. Beneath the flexor retinaculum, the tibial nerve divides into the medial plantar nerve and the lateral plantar nerve. We'll see where these go in the next section. In the leg, the tibial nerve supplies gastrocnemius, plantaris, soleus, and all three of the deep flexor muscles, including tibialis posterior. Now, we'll follow the common perineal nerve. As it passes under the perineus longus muscle, the common perineal nerve divides into the superficial perineal nerve and the deep perineal nerve. The superficial perineal nerve runs down beneath perineus longus. It emerges here and continues down to the foot as a sensory nerve, as we'll see in the next section. 
the superficial perineal nerve supplies perineus longus and perineus brevis. The deep perineal nerve runs under perineus longus. Here it is again. And then under this adjoining muscle, which is extensor digitorum longus. Here's the deep perineal nerve emerging, just medial to the anterior tibial vessels and medial to tibialis anterior. The deep perineal nerve follows the same course as the anterior tibial vessels as it runs down the leg and under the extensor retinaculum. Of the muscles that we've already seen in the leg, the deep perineal nerve supplies tibialis anterior and perineus tertius. Now let's review what we've seen of the vessels and nerves of the leg and ankle region. Here's the long saphenous vein, the short saphenous vein, and the popliteal vein. Here's the popliteal artery, the perineal artery, and the posterior tibial artery, the medial plantar and lateral plantar arteries, and the anterior tibial artery. Now the nerves, the tibial nerve, the medial plantar nerve, and the lateral plantar nerve, the common perineal, superficial perineal, and deep perineal nerves. That brings us to the end of this section on the leg and ankle. In the next section, we'll look at the foot.